The dark secrets of Buddy Holly came out after his death. Now, let's talk about the legendary Buddy Holly and his band, The Crickets. Buddy Holly, celebrated for timeless classics such as That'll Be The Day and Peggy Sue, was a groundbreaking figure in rock and roll. His tragic death on February 3, 1959, known as The Day The Music Died, deeply affected fans World We Day. However, there are fascinating details about his legacy that many people might not be aware of. In this discussion, we'll explore some of the less known and more mysterious parts of Buddy Holly's story, including surprising revelations that came to light after he passed away. Join us as we delve into these aspects of Buddy Holly's extraordinary contribution to music. Humble Beginnings Buddy Holly's path to becoming a music icon began in Lubbock, Texas, where he was born on September 7, 1936. As the youngest child in the Holly family, with three older siblings, Travis, Patricia, and Larry. His early interest in music was encouraged by his family, particularly his brothers and their mother, Ella Drake. Despite the financial struggles faced by his parents, Lawrence and Ella Holly, the family was filled with love and support. Lawrence worked as a tailor while Ella was a homemaker, but they both ensured Buddy's talent was fostered. From a young age, Buddy admired his brothers Travis and Larry, seeing them as heroes. His musical journey kicked off when he was just five years old, after attending a local talent show with his brothers. There, Buddy performed with a toy violin coated in oil to silence it, charming the audience and judges alike. This performance won the Holly family a $5 prize, marking the beginning of Buddy's love for music. However, the outbreak of World War II brought a brief pause to this harmonious life, as Larry and Travis enlisted in the Marines and served in the Pacific. Travis even participated in the crucial Battle of Iwo Jima and was fortunate to return home safely. After the war, with his brothers back home, Buddy received a special gift from Travis, an acoustic guitar. With Travis's guidance, Buddy quickly took to the guitar, practicing tirelessly and never looking back. His passion for music grew with each passing day, influenced by three main genres. Country Western music from Texas was a significant influence on his unique style, shaping the musician Buddy Holly would become. Buddy Holly's early musical experiences were profoundly shaped by the iconic yodeling voice of Hank Williams, which significantly influenced his vocal style and set a foundation for his future performances. Additionally, bluegrass music played a crucial role in Buddy's artistic development. Together with his close friend, Bob Montgomery, Buddy explored this genre, mastering traditional stringed instruments such as the banjo, mandolin, and fiddle. The incorporation of bluegrass elements into his music added depth and versatility to his repertoire. Another critical influence on Buddy's music was rhythm and blues, R&B. In the 1940s, R&B was mainly performed by African-American artists and catered to African-American audiences, and it wasn't widely accepted for young white musicians to play this genre. Nonetheless, Buddy's love for music transcended societal barriers. Alongside Bob Montgomery, he would secretly listen to R&B broadcasts in his parents' car, drawn to the genre's raw, soulful sounds that combined classic blues with electric guitars and a distinctive edge. As rock and roll emerged in his high school years, Buddy was captivated by this new musical movement, with Elvis Presley leaving a significant mark on him due to his innovative style. This influence solidified Buddy's resolve to pursue music not just as a hobby, but as a lifelong passion. Partnering with Bob Montgomery, they started performing at local gatherings, becoming known as Buddy and Bob. As they matured, they expanded their venues to bars east of Avenue D, where they could experience live performances by African-American artists. Despite his fascination with the authentic sounds of R&B, Buddy mostly performed music from traditionally white genres in his live shows, 
reflecting the complex racial dynamics of the music industry at the time. Early Struggles Every path to fame involves its challenges and successes, and Buddy Holly's journey was no different. Before he discovered his distinctive musical style, Buddy experimented with forming a bluegrass group. Unfortunately, his early recordings didn't capture the essence of what he was aiming for. Nevertheless, a significant opportunity was just on the horizon. In 1956, a talent scout from Decca Records noticed Buddy's potential and offered him a contract. This moment marked a pivotal point in Buddy's career, leading him and Bob, his group at the time, to Nashville for a recording session. However, there was an unexpected turn of events. Decca was interested in signing Buddy as a solo act, not as part of a group. Buddy initially resisted, insisting that he wouldn't sign unless Bob was also included. Eventually, Bob resolved the situation by leaving the group to pursue a successful solo career on his own. During the Nashville session, Buddy recorded Blue Day's Black Nights, a track that would become his first hit. Decca Records recognized his talent and signed him to a deal. However, their enthusiasm didn't translate into the support Buddy had hoped for. The record sold only 18,000 copies, and the label did little to promote it. This experience with a major label left Buddy feeling somewhat disappointed, as the backing he received didn't match his expectations or the potential he knew his music had. Decca Records' involvement with Buddy Holly went beyond just producing his music. They often imposed their own studio musicians, pushed for a more conventional singing style, and even restricted Buddy from playing the guitar on his recordings. Frustrated by these constraints, Buddy and his band decided to take control of their music career. They headed to Clovis, New Mexico, to record independently at Norman Petty's studio. It was during one of these sessions that Buddy and his bandmate, Jerry, penned the hit song That'll Be The Day, inspired by a line from John Wayne's film The Searchers. The song was, in a way, a nod to their struggles with Decca. Unfortunately, the label's producers delivered a disappointing mix of the track. They chose to focus on another single, Modern Don Juan, and released it on Christmas Eve, seemingly setting it up to fail. A month after their one-year contract with Decca ended, the label informed Buddy that they had no intention of renewing their agreement. However, this wasn't the end of Decca's hold over Buddy's music, as they retained rights to his songs for another five years. Following this ordeal, the original band dissolved, leaving only the teenage drummer, Jerry J.I. Allison, remaining loyal to Buddy. This setback marked the end of one chapter in Buddy's career, but also set the stage for the formation of the Crickets, signaling the beginning of a new and significant phase in his musical journey. Charles Harden When Buddy Holly and Jerry returned to Clovis for another recording session, their manager, Norman Petty, recognized their talent and saw an opportunity to propel their music career forward. The agreement they reached was strategic. Petty would leverage his influence as a recording artist to get local DJs to play their song. In exchange, Buddy and Jerry would return in February to record an encore of That'll Be The Day, and Petty would be credited as a co-author, receiving 50% of the song's revenues. However, they faced a significant legal hurdle. Buddy's contract with Decca prohibited him from recording that single with any other label for five years. Norman Petty devised a clever workaround. Buddy would be credited on the single as Charles Harden, using his genuine first and middle names, and the song would be released under the name of a newly formed band. This was done in hopes that Decca's attorneys would not recognize the connection. When it came to naming the new band, Buddy wanted something reminiscent of the R&B group The Spiders, which he admired. He briefly considered the name The Beatles, but dismissed it as too absurd for a band name. Ultimately, he settled on The Crickets, a name that would soon become iconic in the world of rock and roll. 
This creative maneuvering allowed Buddy Holly and the Crickets to sidestep contractual restrictions and launch their song into the public eye, marking a pivotal moment in their music career. The controversy stemmed from the fact that, during the same period, the same musicians released songs under both the names Buddy Holly and the Crickets and also performed live as Buddy Holly and the Crickets. To navigate the contractual constraints and release their new single, Norman Petty needed to find a label willing to produce and release the song discreetly. He secured a deal with Brunswick Records, a subsidiary of Coral Records, which in turn was a division of Decca Records. This strategy required Buddy to maintain a low profile and refrain from signing any documents to prevent Decca's lawyers from uncovering their scheme. In March 1957, Holly recorded the ballad Words of Love in Clovis, utilizing a groundbreaking technique for the rock and roll genre. Buddy used overdubbing, a method pioneered by Les Paul and Mary Ford, to record the lead and rhythm guitar parts by himself, thus personalizing it for rock and roll. This innovation marked a significant moment in music production. However, a conflict arose when choral officials realized that Charles Harden of the Crickets was actually Buddy Holly. Despite potential legal issues with Decca's lawyers, Norman Petty managed to negotiate a compromise that involved splitting royalties from the sales of the reimagined That'll Be the Day. Interestingly, Buddy was not fully aware of this arrangement. Nonetheless, this new version of the song had already begun making waves, capturing the hearts and ears of young Americans across the country. This success helped Buddy Holly find his unique sound and solidify his place in the music world. Peggy Sue In the summer of 1957, despite still seeing limited financial rewards from his songwriting, Buddy Holly booked more recording time with Norman Petty. During this productive session, the Crickets released I'm Gonna Love You Too, but Buddy had another trick up his sleeve. He introduced a new song named Cindy Lou, which had a slower tempo and an alluring Latin groove. However, they encountered a challenge. Jerry, the drummer, struggled to keep up with the song's rolling tempo during recording takes. Buddy, ever the motivator, made Jerry an enticing offer to overcome this hurdle. He promised to credit Jerry as a songwriter if he could nail the entire song in a single take. To make the offer even more appealing, Buddy proposed naming the song after Jerry's girlfriend, Peggy Sue Guerin, whom Jerry was deeply smitten with. This gesture not only motivated Jerry, but also led to the creation of one of Buddy Holly's most iconic tracks, now known as Peggy Sue. The previous setbacks with Decca were now a thing of the past for Buddy and the Crickets. With That'll Be The Day selling over 50,000 copies, they were poised for an East Coast tour. Interestingly, this tour happened because of a booking mistake. The tour promoters had originally intended to book The Crows, an all-black vocal group, but instead ended up with the Texas Quartet. This error led to Buddy Holly and The Crickets opening for R&B acts in all-black clubs in New York, further broadening their musical experience and exposure. Upon receiving a lukewarm reception and even jeers during the first two nights of their performances in D.C. and Baltimore, Buddy Holly knew something had to change. In a bold move to win over the audience, he decided to kick off the third show with a high-energy rendition of Bo Diddley by the legendary blues guitarist Bo Diddley. The crowd's enthusiastic response was immediate, and from that moment on, the Crickets effortlessly captivated audiences of all backgrounds. The success of That'll Be The Day had already set Buddy Holly and the Crickets on the path to stardom, and there was no turning back. Hits like Oh Boy and Peggy Sue quickly followed, securing their status in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Their groundbreaking appearances on national TV programs like The Ed Sullivan Show and American Bandstand further cemented their position. Buddy's unique vocal style and innovative guitar playing attracted fans in droves, marking the beginning of an era dominated by their distinctive sound. 
The next major opportunity for Buddy Holly and his band came with the biggest show of stars for 1957, a tour that was akin to a traveling circus featuring top talents from soul, R&B, and early rock and roll. During this tour, Buddy had the chance to meet and mingle with legendary artists such as Paul Anka, The Drifters, Chuck Berry, and the Everly Brothers, among others. This tour also brought a special moment involving Peggy Sue Guerin, the namesake of one of Buddy's most famous songs. When the tour stopped in Sacramento on October 18th, where Peggy Sue was living with her mother, Buddy invited her to the concert. In a delightful surprise, he announced they would perform Peggy Sue in honor of a special guest, playfully commenting on her fortunate naming. Peggy Sue went on to be a massive hit, selling over a million copies. At the peak of his fame, Buddy was only 21 years old. As time went on, Buddy Holly and the Crickets evolved from producing chart toppers to creating timeless classics. Tracks like Maybe Baby and Rave On became anthems for a burgeoning youth culture, skillfully blending elements of country, rock, and rhythm and blues in fresh, innovative ways. What truly distinguished Buddy from many of his peers was his songwriting talent. Unlike many artists of his time, he composed most of his own songs, leaving a legacy of original hits that have lasted for decades. Buddy's inventive lyrics and captivating stage presence established him as a rock and roll icon, inspiring a new generation of musicians and fans alike with his enduring influence on the music world. Trials Abound after an exhausting tour, Buddy Holly and the Crickets returned to Lubbock in December, only to be greeted by a series of unsettling developments. Firstly, Buddy was confronted with the news that his long-distance girlfriend Echo had fallen in love with someone else and was on the verge of getting married. It's important to note that Buddy hadn't exactly been faithful himself, as there were rumors circulating about his involvement in a brief affair with an older married woman and even a supposed threesome that included Little Richard and his girlfriend. The band faced another setback when Nick Sullivan, Buddy's backing guitarist, decided to leave. Exhausted from relentless touring and unable to get along with Jerry, Sullivan's departure added to the band's challenges. However, the situation worsened significantly when Sullivan approached Norman Petty to settle his royalties. This led to the discovery that Petty had been mismanaging the band's finances. Despite already taking half of the Cricket's royalties as a co-author, Petty had been using the band's earnings for his personal expenses. Adding to the betrayal, the Cricket's and Buddy, who were devoutly religious, had asked for 40% of their royalties to be donated to their respective churches, a request that Petty had ignored. This mismanagement and breach of trust marked a turning point in the relationship between Buddy Holly, the Cricket's, and their manager, casting a shadow over their financial and personal affairs. The reasons behind Buddy Holly's hesitation to fire Norman Petty immediately are not entirely clear, but it's evident that he recognized Petty could no longer be trusted. Tensions reached a new high during a 1958 tour of Hawaii and Australia, featuring Jerry Lee Lewis and Paul Anka. Despite Petty's objections, tour managers demanded that the Crickets take on a less prominent role, serving as the opening act. Holly agreed, but only in exchange for a higher fee. The situation intensified when Jerry, J.I. Allison, announced his plans to marry Peggy Sue. Petty, trying to maintain control, suggested that the drummer should be fired, arguing that a married pop star might lose appeal among female fans. In a telling response, Buddy suggested that perhaps Petty, who was himself married, should be the one to be fired. However, these dramatic suggestions went unacted upon, and as they set off for London on February 27, 1958, Norman Petty remained a part of their entourage. Unbeknownst to them, this tour would become one of the most influential events in the history of popular music. Their impact on the British music scene was profound, leaving an indelible mark on future icons like the Beatles, Eric Clapton, and the Rolling Stones.
These artists not only borrowed elements of the Cricket's stage presence, but also drew inspiration from their songwriting style. Despite the internal conflicts and the eventual breakup of the Crickets in June 1958, the legacy of their influence on the music world, particularly in Britain, was already cemented, shaping the future of rock and roll. A Love Story Buddy Holly's life took an unexpected turn during a visit to his music publisher's office in New York, where he met Maria Elena Santiago, the company's enchanting secretary. Originally from Puerto Rico, Maria Elena had moved to New York to live with her aunt and had adhered to her aunt's advice to steer clear of musicians, never having been on a date. However, Buddy's charm quickly won her over, and they agreed to go out. Just a week after their first date, Buddy introduced Maria Elena to his parents in New York. Remarkably, only two weeks after they first met, the couple got married. Initially, Buddy and Maria Elena planned to settle in Texas, but they soon encountered Lubbock's deeply ingrained prejudice and segregation, not only against African Americans, but also against Latin Americans. Their decision to relocate was cemented following an unsettling experience at an ice cream parlor, where a waitress blatantly ignored Maria Elena due to her heritage. Realizing the need for a more welcoming and inclusive environment, Maria Elena suggested they move back to the diverse and multicultural city of New York. Buddy readily agreed, and for the next six months, they made New York their home, embracing its vibrancy and diversity away from the discrimination they had faced in Texas. Immersed in the vibrant culture of Greenwich Village, Buddy Holly explored a variety of music genres, attended poetry readings at local coffee houses, and dreamed of ambitious projects like collaborating with artists such as Ray Charles and Mahalia Jackson, or even venturing into acting. Grateful for the success and passion the music industry had ignited in him, Buddy also began working as a music producer with Richie Valens, among his first protégés. Despite his hit singles and growing fame, Buddy faced financial struggles due to his royalty earnings being controlled by Norman Petty, locked in bank accounts. In late October 1958, determined to resolve this issue, Buddy and Maria Elena decided to confront Petty. They were shocked to learn that Jerry and Joe B. Malden, members of Buddy's band, had been persuaded by Petty to stay with his management. Frustrated and resolute, Buddy aimed to break free from Petty's control and reclaim his finances. However, Norman Petty's astonishing response, as Maria Elena recounted, was, I'd rather see you starve to death first. That day, Buddy managed to extricate himself from Petty's grasp, but at the cost of losing his cherished band, the Crickets. The journey back was emotionally taxing, marked by Buddy's tears and a heavy heart. This period reflected a significant turning point in Buddy Holly's life, leading to the poignant moment known as the day the music died, symbolizing a loss not only for Buddy, but for the music world at large. Buddy Holly's life ended tragically and suddenly on February 3, 1959, profoundly altering the trajectory of rock and roll history. The lead-up to this fateful day is marked by a series of small decisions and events that make the story even more haunting. After splitting from Norman Petty and the Crickets, Buddy was ready to begin the Winter Dance Party Tour in 1959, performing alongside J.P. the Big Bopper, Richardson and his young protege, Richie Valens. This tour had them crisscrossing the Midwest, playing in small towns across Minnesota and Iowa during a particularly harsh winter. The brutal travel conditions, including freezing temperatures and a bus with inadequate heating, took a severe toll on everyone involved. Frostbite was a real concern, affecting at least one member of the tour. Exhausted and unable to tolerate the miserable bus rides any longer, Buddy reached a breaking point upon their arrival in Clear Lake, Iowa. He decided to charter a plane to their next venue in Moorhead, Minnesota, seeking some respite from the relentless journey. This decision to fly rather than endure another bus ride would have unforeseeable and tragic consequences. 
The choice of who would board that plane alongside Buddy would seal the fate of three of rock and roll's brightest stars, changing the course of music history forever. Initially, Waylon Jennings, Buddy Holly's replacement bassist, had a seat on that ill-fated flight. However, out of concern for J.P. Richardson, who was ailing, Jennings selflessly gave up his seat. Meanwhile, Richie Valens, both excited and apprehensive about flying in a small plane, won his seat in a now-famous coin toss against band member Tommy Allsup. The plane took off from Mason City, Iowa, just before 1 a.m. on February 3rd, tasked with transporting the artists to their next performance. What appeared to be a routine flight soon turned into a catastrophe. Shortly after takeoff, the aircraft lost control and crashed into a snow-covered cornfield, instantly claiming the lives of everyone on board. The full magnitude of the tragedy didn't become clear until the next morning when the wreckage was discovered. The iconic singer Don McLean would later immortalize this event as The Day the Music Died in his famous song American Pie. This term has since become synonymous with the crash, reflecting the shock and profound impact it had on the music world. Early investigations into the crash that took Buddy Holly's life, along with J.P. the Big Bopper, Richardson and Richie Valens, identified the pilot's inability to fly by instruments alone, severe weather conditions, and limited visibility as the main causes. Further inquiries also highlighted possible ice formation on the carburetor, issues with the aircraft's rudder panel, and an unevenly distributed load as contributing factors. These technical aspects, however, only touched the surface of the profound loss felt by the music world and Buddy Holly's fans. Now, as we delve into the more speculative and intriguing aspects of Buddy Holly's legacy, it's interesting to consider the dark secrets that the iconic rock and roll legend might have been hiding. Despite being seen as the poster boy of rock and roll, it's natural to ponder what might have lain behind his signature glasses. Holly's career, though short, left a significant mark on music, sparking curiosity about the possibilities of his unexplored potential. What if he had more time to develop his music? What if he had ventured into different musical genres? Buddy Holly's story, filled with its what-ifs, remains a captivating subject for rock and roll enthusiasts and historians alike. While his public persona was largely that of a clean-cut and pioneering musician, the complexities of his personal life and the pressures of fame in the 1950s music industry may have concealed aspects of his life that the public was unaware of. Yet, regardless of any hidden secrets, Holly's innovative contributions to music and his influence on future generations of musicians are undeniable. Let's continue to celebrate his legacy and the indelible mark he left on the world of music. The Mystery Maria Elena Holly, Buddy Holly's widow, experienced profound grief following his untimely death in the plane crash, a tragedy that deeply impacted the music world and most acutely, her own life. Their marriage had been full of promise, with Maria Elena playing integral roles in Buddy's career, including serving as his road manager and secretary. Her presence was a constant during his travels, and she was set to join him on the winter dance tour, but stayed home due to her pregnancy. Maria Elena has expressed that had she accompanied Buddy on the tour, she might have dissuaded him from boarding the plane, potentially altering the course of history. Throughout the tour, Buddy made frequent calls home to check on her, highlighting the close bond and concern he had for his wife amidst the tour's challenges, including mechanical issues with the buses and illnesses among the crew. The shock and grief from Buddy's sudden death were devastating for Maria Elena, leading to a miscarriage shortly thereafter. Overwhelmed by sorrow, she found it impossible to visit his grave or attend his funeral. Despite these personal tragedies, Maria Elena Holly's contribution to preserving Buddy. Holly's legacy is significant, but often under-recognized. 
She has worked tirelessly to keep his memory alive, managing his estate and ensuring that his influence on music and his contributions are remembered. Through her efforts, Buddy Holly's legacy continues to inspire new generations, ensuring that his music and impact endure. As Maria Elena Holly grappled with the heartbreaking loss of Buddy Holly, she initially found it hard to confront the tragic reality of his passing. However, the outpouring of support and curiosity from Buddy's fans, who were eager to learn more about the legendary musician, helped her recognize the importance of her role in preserving his legacy. Understanding the fans' desire for insights into Buddy's creative intentions and the future direction he had envisioned for his music, Maria Elena found the inspiration to continue her efforts in safeguarding his contributions to the world of music. After marrying a second time and having three children, she eventually divorced. Maria Elena continues to protect Buddy Holly's intellectual property and lives in Dallas, Texas. In 2010, her commitment to her late husband's memory and legacy led her to become a founding member of the Buddy Holly Educational Foundation, an organization dedicated to music education and preserving Buddy's influence on music. Maria Elena has shared that it remains emotionally difficult for her to listen to Buddy's songs, a testament to the deep love and connection she shared with him. Nevertheless, she firmly believes that while Buddy Holly, the person may have left this world, his music lives on. She emphasizes that the music has not died, highlighting Buddy Holly's lasting influence on the music industry. His legacy continues to resonate with musicians and fans alike, serving as a vibrant and enduring tribute to his genius and the timeless appeal of his work. Unraveling the Unknown Buddy Holly, more than just the man behind the iconic Geek Chic glasses, was a true innovator in the rock and roll scene. His story is rich with lesser-known facts, dark periods, and surprising turns. While many fans are familiar with his polished image, fewer are aware of Holly's rebellious streak. In a time when artists often had little say over their music, Holly was a pioneer who boldly claimed his artistic freedom. His decision to part ways with Decca Records over creative differences highlighted his determination to make music on his own terms. Renowned author Joan Gribben regards Booty Holly as one of the most influential figures in the early days of rock and roll, largely due to Holly's songwriting skills. Unlike Elvis Presley, Holly didn't rally on cover songs and broke away from the traditional three-chord structure derived from the 12-bar blues. His role as a trailblazer wasn't limited to songwriting. Holly also took charge in producing and performing his music, effectively managing himself as an artist. This innovative approach even extended to recording techniques, earning him pioneer status. According to Keith Richards, Buddy Holly and the Crickets were the first self-contained rock and roll band in history, embodying the roles of songwriters and performers simultaneously and showcasing their commitment through their prolific recording sessions. Another fascinating aspect of Holly's musical journey was his unique choice of instruments. Though renowned for his guitar skills, he had a keen interest in incorporating distinctive sounds into his music. A notable example is his use of the Celesta, an unusual keyboard instrument that was largely unknown to the general public at the time. Holly's openness to experimentation and boundary pushing reflects his immense creative spirit and underscores his lasting impact on the music industry. The Saga of Buddy Holly the tale of Buddy Holly's iconic glasses is as captivating as the man himself. After his tragic death, the glasses vanished, only to be unexpectedly found over two decades later in a courthouse supply closet. Their discovery ignited a legal battle over rightful ownership between Maria Elena Holly, Buddy's widow, and Buddy's parents. Ultimately, Maria Elena secured the glasses and, in a gesture of goodwill, donated them to the Buddy Holly Center in Lubbock, Texas. Today, they are displayed as a homage to his lasting legacy, symbolizing more than just Holly's style, but also his impact on music and pop culture. 
However, Buddy Holly's life story extends beyond physical memorabilia, encapsulating a mix of personal triumphs and challenges. His career was marked by professional rivalries and unresolved issues, reflecting the complexities of his relationships, including those with his siblings. As a student, Buddy was known for his bright but mischievous nature, often engaging in practical jokes that amused his peers while frustrating his teachers. An often overlooked aspect of Holly's character was his interest in mysticism. He collected books related to the paranormal and even sought the advice of a fortune teller about his career. The fortune teller's cautionary advice now carries a haunting resonance, despite Buddy's initial dismissal of the warning. This blend of achievements, personal dynamics, and unique interests paints a fuller picture of Buddy Holly, showcasing the depth and diversity of his life and personality beyond his musical legacy. The Peggy Sue Mystery Buddy Holly's personal life remains a subject of fascination and intrigue even decades after his untimely death. In 2007, Peggy Sue Guerin, a significant figure in Buddy's circle, added a new chapter to the saga by publishing her memoir, Whatever Happened to Peggy Sue? This book challenged the conventional narrative surrounding the iconic song, Peggy Sue Got Married. Contrary to the popular belief that the song was inspired by her romance with Cricket's drummer, Jerry Allison, Jaron proposed an alternative explanation. She suggested that the song was actually about a complicated love triangle involving herself, Buddy Holly, and Maria Elena Santiago. This revelation introduced a fresh layer of complexity to the already intriguing story of Buddy Holly's life and the inspirations behind his music. The publication of Jaron's memoir led to a legal dispute when Maria Elena Holly, Buddy's widow, filed a lawsuit to prevent its release. Maria Elena's response to the claims made in the book was pointed and suggestive, noting, It's very interesting that this woman makes up all these stories. This clash of perspectives and the ensuing legal battle add, further intrigue to the mysterious and often contentious narratives that have emerged following Buddy Holly's death, illustrating the enduring impact of his legacy and the personal relationships that shaped his life and work. Buddy's Legacy Buddy Holly's legacy in the music world is monumental, continuing to resonate with and inspire artists across generations. His influence is evident in the work of iconic musicians like Bruce Springsteen and the Beatles, underscoring the broad reach of his impact. Holly's remarkable contributions to the industry were formally recognized in 1986 when he was posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, cementing his status as a pioneer. What truly set Buddy Holly apart was not just his memorable melodies and catchy tunes, it was his role as a trailblazer in the music industry. Holly showed that musicians could be more than just performers, they could be innovators and creators, actively taking control of their careers. This approach challenged the existing norms and opened new avenues for how music could be created, produced, and performed. Holly's innovative spirit and artistic vision laid the groundwork for future generations of musicians, encouraging them to pursue their unique paths and push the boundaries of music. Through his enduring influence, Buddy Holly remains a symbol of creativity and independence in the music world, inspiring artists to explore new horizons and redefine what is possible in their craft. Thank you for watching the entire video on the Famous People channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more in-depth content. We appreciate your engagement and look forward to sharing more intriguing stories with you in our upcoming videos. Goodbye.